That is, I thought I deleted that. There's no theology class anymore. I could have swore I deleted that. <laughs> All right. We got like 23 seconds. How's everyone doing? Again, happy Valentine's Day. I wore red for you, Layla. She's not impressed at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She's like, is that all you got for me? A shirt? We uh, welcome everybody. Hope uh, folks at home are uh, tuning in. Um, please remember to try to share if you would like to share. Uh, today's sermon is uh, Noah, a righteous man in a fur coat? Question mark. So uh, you'll understand soon enough. Oh, these are last week's. That explains everything. In one second, we'll have the right slides up. What's that? It's loading? Oh, great. Oh, please. <laughs> There's always something going on. Perfect. Now we just go to... All right, excellent, excellent. So we're going to start off uh, this morning by singing uh, Come Christians, Join and Sing. We'll just sing uh, all three verses of it. Scripture is coming from Genesis 6. Um, break the passage up into two different phases. This is phase one here. We'll be reading chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 5 and read to 22. So the Lord God observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was constantly and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals and small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I'm sorry I ever made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. 
Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on the earth at the time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and filled with violence. And God observed all this corruption in the world for everyone on earth was corrupt. These are some bad people, huh? So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them out all along, excuse me, out all, all out along with the earth. But build a large boat with cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Leave an 18-inch window below the roof all the way around the boat. Put the door on the side and build three decks alongside the boat, the lower, the middle, and the upper. Look, I am about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die. But I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife, and your sons and your wives, and their wives. Bring a pair of every kind of animal, male and female, into the boat with you and keep them alive during the flood. Pairs of every kind of animal and every kind of, <coughs> every kind of bird and every kind of animal and every kind of small animal that scurries along the ground will come to you and be kept alive. And be sure to take on board enough food for the family and all the animals. So Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded. We'll continue reading that passage in a bit. So let's continue our worship by we're going to be singing King of Grace and then Ocean.
And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the wind When oceans arise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are Um, sorry, my papers are all over the place. A few things. Uh, we, of course, take this time to uh, pray, taking requests. Um, my, um, continue to pray for my brother Hugh. His um, bilirubin levels, I think that's how it's pronounced are up and they need to come down so um, for the treatment that he's on which is uh, an immunotherapy type of uh, treatment for the cancer that he has so just be praying that uh, my brother Hugh uh, his uh, 
those levels will go down and he'll be able to continue uh, the treatment and that God would uh, continue to uh, do a work in, in healing her. So. Uh, also, uh, we've been praying for Susan, Anna Alicia's mom, and um, she's been, um, she's kind of up and down. So uh, I, yesterday when she went to visit her, she was actually awake and talking and doing pretty good. The day before, she wasn't awake and not doing so great. So we just to continue to be praying for Susan um, and uh, AA. She's uh, with her actually today, uh, now. So uh, just continue to pray for Susan. What else? Good things too, as well as prayer requests. Loanne. All right, so Flo Ann, um, her daughter's niece, had a baby, and um, something happened. Uh, potentially, she was in labor too long or something, but the, um, there's been some bla uh, brain bleeding and some other things related to her, uh, her uh, skull and brain. Uh, so be praying for Brody. Okay, so let's be praying for Brody that... Um, the little one would make a full recovery. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, Jerry Rudenfeld, who was um, a longtime member here at the church, um, She's passed away, I guess, this week. So um, our food pantry is actually named after her. So be praying for uh, her family. I know that she has uh, uh, children and grandchildren and such, great-grandchildren uh, lived in the area. So thanks, Mom. What else? Anything online? Yeah. Megan? So Cheryl's um, procedure uh, went well, so that's excellent. This is the Henry Tut, Henry and Cheryl Tut. So continue to pray for Cheryl, uh, full recovery there. Um, so that's that's a pray. That's great news. Excellent, Carol. Is it something that's more like muscular neuro neurological kind of thing or the rehab? Do you know what it is that she's working on? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, Carol's niece, Heather, uh, who's had COVID and she's um, at a rehab. So I'm not exactly sure what they're working on with her. I don't know if it's a, the breathing and body, the whole thing. But just be praying for Heather uh, that she will make uh, a full recovery. Thanks, Carol. Lynn. Oh, excellent. That's awesome. Yeah. So Sandy, who we've been praying for with pancreatic cancer, and we've been praying also because she res uh, got pneumonia. Uh, she is over her pneumonia, which is a uh, huge answer to prayer. So continue to pray for her, um, the cancer and the, the treatment and all that she's going through. Bill.
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So for yeah, for those who are local and are veterans, uh, Bill was saying that they have um, potentially extras each day. So give them a call, let them know. That, yeah, for the vaccine. I'm not sure what I said, but it was obviously wrong. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, for a vaccine for the COVID, um, and that they would uh, so give them a call, and they will uh, if they have the extras at the end of the day, they'll get get it to you. So Bill got his. What was that? Oh, on the list. Okay, yeah, very good. Thanks, Bill. The White River Junction VA. Anything else? Any? Megan? Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, we here in Vermont, we, uh, in the north, the far northeast, struggle with that. So uh, having more sunlight is nice. The sun's a little bit higher in the sky, which is great. So spring is just around the corner. <coughs> yeah, after a few more snowstorms, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, let's pray. Uh, Lord God, we are so thankful that you are a God who um, is loving and kind. Um, you are holy, just, and you are merciful and good. And um, sometimes we don't always feel that way, and even when we read Scripture, uh, it can be slightly confusing um, because um, we seem to get angry pretty easily. And um, I pray, Lord, that uh, as we walk in this journey of life that we would look to you that we would not be afraid to speak to you that we would not be afraid to come to you but that we would come as children to uh, a father and a mother who loves us tremendously and I pray God that we would open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us because you've promised that this journey, no matter where we are in that journey, no matter if we feel like we're, we're moving in an upward direction and, we, and we're seeing clearing and there's beauty and we're just feeling great about life, or if we feel like we're in a downward trend and there's rocks and, these ho and we keep tripping and falling and hurting, and that we would know that you are with us in this journey and we simply have to turn to you for help. And that we don't have to be afraid of that. And we don't, and we shouldn't be flippant about it, but that we would truly long to be in relationship with you above all else. And watch how you do the amazing things that you do in each one of our lives. So Lord, this morning we bring to you all the different requests that we have, many of which are unspoken, things that are, um, sometimes they eat at us, uh, people in our lives that we cannot control, people that are <coughs> doing things that are either destructive to others or self-destructive, and I pray, God, that you would give us the strength and the energy to be able to love those people the way that they need to be loved. Sometimes that's tough, and sometimes that's just super compassionate. But either way, Lord, that you would give us wisdom and give us the strength to do that. And that we will see, by your grace, lives changed, our own included. And Lord, for all of these that we present to you that have illnesses, I pray for my brother. I continue to pray for him. And that these um, Bellarubin or Bilirubin levels will go down, that they need to go down. And, and that he can continue on his uh, treatment. And that, Lord, you'd bring healing into his body, God, we pray in your name. We pray for um, uh, AA mother, uh, AA's mom, uh, Susan, and that you would continue to work in her body and her life and her lungs and all of that that's included uh, that needs to be strengthened and healed. We pray, God, for that. And that you would continue to um, uh, bond 
uh, Anna Alicia to her mom, and they continue to grow in that relationship. Um, just a nurturing, loving, and good relationship. Lord, we pray for this uh, young one that Floan mentioned, Brody, and um, what a um, what a hard thing to to think about and to experience. We pray for the parents, of course, and as they are, I'm sure, just very, very concerned and uh, fearful. We pray, Lord, for Brody, that you would bring healing and that there would be just a full recovery of this little one and that the, uh, the, the parents and all would, would see your hand in it and give you glory for it. Uh, we pray for uh, Jerry Rudenfeld's uh, family as she has, you've uh, seen fit to take her home, and we pray, Lord, that you would give uh, their family strength and uh, in this time and um, yeah, just give them peace, Lord, that uh, surpasses all human understanding. We're so grateful that uh, Cheryl Tutt's uh, procedures have gone well, and um, Lord, we just pray that whatever uh, other things uh, take place, that you would continue to heal her body and uh, keep it free from any cancers or anything that would um, seek to destroy. And we continue to pray for Henry and his back as well. Uh, we ask for... Um, uh, Carol's niece Heather as uh, she's in rehabilitation currently God and I just pray that whatever all that need is in her body that they would uh, that you would bring healing and she would have full recovery uh, we ask Lord and for uh, Sandy who we've been praying for with pancreatic cancer we praise you that the pneumonia is gone that's a huge blessing and we just ask that you would uh, uh, continue to heal her body uh, of this cancer Lord, there's just so many other things that we have and we could spend all day on just praying for, uh, for people in our lives and for ourselves and our situations. And um, we just ask, Lord, that you would, uh, through the vaccines and all the measures that we're doing, that you would uh, eliminate this COVID virus or uh, make it something that is like a cold, um, that we would be able to get on with life for those who are struggling so much right now with mental health issues and depression and, and um, addiction disorders and all of that that has been so much more worsened by this situation, God. Uh, free them up. Free these. Free our, our, our uh, neighborhoods up and uh, our businesses up that we might be able to live life uh, and live it fully. Protect us, Lord, from that and give our uh, bodies strength and antibodies to be able to fight uh, this infection. Uh, Lord, we just, we love you. We pray, appreciate everything that you are doing and continue to do in our lives. And now, Lord, I pray that you give us united hearts and minds as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, we're going to uh, continue our reading. We're going to uh, move to chapter 7, and we're going to read verses 11 through 24. So when Noah was 600 years old, on the 17th day of the second month, all the underground waters erupted from the earth, and the rain fell in mighty torrents from the sky. And the rain continued to fall for 40 days and 40 nights. That very day, Noah had gone into the boat with his wife and his son, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. With them in the boat were pairs of every kind of animal, domestic and wild, large and small, along with every kind of uh, with ev uh, along with birds of every kind. Two by two, they came into the boat, representing every living thing that breathes. A male and female of each kind entered, just as that God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord closed the door behind them. And for 40 days, the floodwaters grew deeper and covered the ground, and lifting the boat high into the earth. As the waters rose higher and higher above the ground, the, the boat floated safely on the surface. Finally, the water covered every even the highest mountain on earth, rising more than 22 feet above the highest peak. All of the living things 
on the earth died, birds, domestic animals, wild animals, small animals, things that scurry around the ground and all the, and all the people. Everything that breathed and lived on dry land died. God wiped out every living thing on earth. We've got that by now, right? Everything is gone. People, <laughs> livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and the birds of the sky all were destroyed. The only people who survived were Noah and with him, uh, and those with him in the boat. And the flood waters covered the earth for 150 days. And we put little arcs in children's rooms, right? It's like this is a great children's story, and you're kind of like, wow, this is devastating. This is horrible. This is something that um, is terrifying. I am somebody who, uh, I understand that the Bible, we believe that the Bible is inspired by God. And I think that uh, what that inspiration refers to is that God's Spirit breathed into people what to speak or what to write. But these people were not 21st century culture. They didn't have meteorology. They didn't have an understanding of the earth and biology and all those things that we understand today. So I believe personally that even the authors of Scripture were writing from their own understanding as God gave them thoughts and words and things of that nature. And let me explain with a story. When I was about four or five years old, um, I remember in our kitchen we used to have like a bar kind of table that was up against the wall. My sisters all think that I don't remember this stuff because I was too young, but I do. And, um, and I remember we had these bar stools. And they were probably, you know, they were definitely taller than the average table, right? But I remember my mom specifically, like we had windows in the kitchen, I remember, and I'm pretty sure there was a shelf above the window. I'm pretty sure about that. Anyway, I remember looking up and my mom saying, you guys don't get into talking to all of us. Don't get into any of this stuff because this stuff is not for you. She may even said it'll kill you. I don't know. You know, who knows what she said. I don't remember all the details. All I knew is everything up there was naughty. Don't touch. Now, as a kid, I'm thinking, I know what else mom hides. Candy. I know certain things that she wants for herself, which is totally legitimate. Kids shouldn't be having everything. And I just remember looking up there and saying, there's a reason my mom doesn't want me to have it. It's because it's delicious. Right? And I remember seeing this box. And I remember seeing fruits and vegetables on the box. And I remember thinking, that must be so good. And as I got, and I remember I was determined to get a hold of this box. So I remember dragging this stool over climbing up and not being able to reach it and I'm pretty sure I found a cookbook or something that I put on the seat climbed up there and I got a hold of the box and I'm like oh man this is good this is good and I remember taking it I remember looking at it and smelling it It didn't smell so good and it looked kind of beige color and I'm like well that's weird for fruit and I remember either sticking my hand in it or pouring it in my hand and putting it in my mouth and this taste was kind of like ew and about that time, my mom walked in, and she said, Michael David! And I'm like, oh, stink, I am busted. And this look, a terrifying look that she had on her face, I was like, oh, snot, I am in trouble. And she runs over, and she grabs me, pulls me off of this height, this chair, and she runs me, and she starts throwing, like, water in my face. And, like, and then she goes, and she makes this weird concoction of mustard and mayo and ketchup, and she's shoving it down my throat. And I'm like, Mom, golly, Moses, I'm sorry. You don't have to do this to me. I won't eat anymore. Do you really want it that bad? It's not going to be good if I throw it up. And sure enough, the most violent thing my mom's ever done to me, she stuck her finger down my throat. And I threw up, and I was crying. I remember I was terrified because my mom got so violent with me. Until later, I discovered that I ate pesticide. And that stuff that was on the box 
was examples of fruit and vegetables that this poison would fix so no pest would eat it. And my, the thought of me with my mom being so angry with me that she did something so violent was a misunderstanding that I had. And she actually loved me and wanted what was best. She wanted to save me. And I really believe that this is what's happening with Noah and this ark. <laughs> I don't doubt that God gets angry. He's got to get angry with some of the things that he sees. And just like, you've got to be kidding me, people. It grieved God's heart that he created humanity because people were so messed up, so violent, so horrible. But there was one guy. Now, this is how God did it back then. He seemed to speak in all throughout the whole books of the law, the, the Torah, the first five, up until um, Israel is delivered from Egypt. He spoke to like one person. And that one person would convey, well, they were supposed to convey the truth, right, of God. So he speaks to Manoah. I've heard Noah called the first evangelist. Now, what an evangelist is, is someone who proclaims the good news. And you're thinking, what is the good news here? They repeat it several times that everything is going to die. The only thing surviving is whoever's in that boat and fish. Everything else is toast, wiping them out. Now, I'm not going to get into whether it was a universal flood or whether it was localized. Uh, it's not important in my book. My bo in my book and my ideas, what's important is what, why is this here? What, what is God trying to communicate to us about himself and about us? So, let's look at Noah for a second. Uh, scripture says that Noah was the most righteous, upright man of his generation, which is either <laughs> a compliment or a criticism, because it sounds like he didn't have a lot of competition. Um, everybody was pretty bad, right? The Hasidic Jews have a saying. They say that Noah was a righteous man in a fur coat. And let me explain. Noah was told that a flood was coming and was going to wipe everything out. And he said, but we're going to make, God says, we're going to make a way of escape. We're going to build this ship. It's going to be huge. It's going to take you almost 100 years for you and your boys to build this thing. And the whole time you're building it, people are going to walk over and say, what are you doing? And Noah's going to say, there's a flood coming. Now, part of the problem was, is in this region, at least, no one had seen any rain. And they're like, you're building this huge ship. Why? Because it's going to do what? And so you know that people started giving Noah some grief over this, right? Like, uh, Noah, <laughs> this, is, this is good. And he's like, listen, guys, all I know is there's a flood coming. Now, interestingly... Noah may have been a righteous man, but evidently he was a lousy leader because there wasn't anyone following him. You see, the truth is that when you are a leader, people follow you. That's by definition is what a leader is. If you walk into a room and try to take charge, that doesn't make you a leader. That may possibly make you a bully. It may make you the only one in the room who knows about a particular topic, but it doesn't make you a leader. What makes you a leader is getting people on the same page as you, building trust so they follow you, right? That's what a leader does. And so here's Noah with specific instructions from God, and there's a flood coming, and all we know is Noah for uh, almost 100 years is preaching to people, and not one single 
person listens. Now, I get it at first because we know these people are pretty messed up. And they're, they're evil and they're violent and they're just bad, bad people. But what do you think when they started seeing animals coming two by two? Every animal out there. I was going to look it up and I forgot, but I was going to see. Animals typically by nature know something's impending, right? And so here these animals start coming, and you know they could tease Noah all for almost 100 years about building this huge ship. But when animals start pooping and coming toward the ark, you know people got to be looking saying, hmm, what's going on here? Something's about to happen, right? Maybe Noah's right. I mean, I think Noah's kind of a crazy man, but are the animals all that crazy? Not one person. So the idea of Noah being a righteous man in a fur coat is this idea they believe that Noah was someone who may have been an extreme introvert. Because when it's cold outside, you have a choice. You either put a coat on to warm yourself, or you build a fire to warm everyone around you. And Noah seems like the type of guy who put a coat on simply to warm himself. Now, he was a righteous man, but it didn't make him a good leader. Didn't make him necessarily someone who was willing to risk more, that more people could come in. Because let's face it, if he was righteous at all, he's looking at all these pagans, heathen, evil. It's like, do I really want you guys in this boat? With me and my family? I don't trust any of you. I mean, how convincing? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. All I know is, is that when the water came, it was only him and his family. Which begs the question about God. So Noah, someone who was upstanding, righteous, tried and had a relationship with God, didn't seem very good at what we would call evangelism, making sure that people around him knew how willing he was to build relationship with those folks, I don't know, or how much he just wanted to stay away from them. Let God deal with them. I don't know. But here we see God, who was not happy at all with how humanity was going. But he says, you know something? I love them. And I'm going to give them over nearly a hundred years to hear about the impending doom that's coming. And give everyone a chance to get on board. And for nearly a hundred years, Noah, however effective or ineffective he was, he was telling them the truth. There's a flood coming. There's a flood coming. God's bringing a flood. And we hear the horribleness of what's happening. But we don't always understand that God warned these people that it catastrophic flood was coming. Do you realize that there is a flood story for almost every culture in the world? And that's not an indication that they're all fabrications. That's an indication that there was a, some kind of flood that happened that was pretty catastrophic, right? What's interesting is, in all of those others, the gods wiped out everybody and started over. Only Yahweh saved. Only the, the, by the story in Scripture actually saved p these people. It was, for that time, the most progressive thing out there. The idea that God, a God who saw the misery and the ridiculousness of, and the evilness of people, but yet he spared. That's amazing. That the God we serve loves. He loves so much that he gives, and he's so patient, right? And he gives opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And he says, listen, even if people aren't going to listen, I want you who 
know or believe that you are righteous, that you, those of us who have a relationship with God, I want you to, to think about what you're willing to risk for your neighbor, for your family, for your church. What are you willing to risk to get people and help them to know about God? We get so worried about our lives and our livelihoods. We get so fearful of other people or other situations or other things, and we huddle up and we hide. And we become righteous people with fur coats. Obviously not all of us. But I think there's a tendency for that. And we get comfortable because we know we got God on our side. So the worst thing can happen is death, and then what? I'm going to heaven. Yay! How about the rest of those people? I don't think they're going to like heaven. They're pretty bad. I mean, let's face it. They deserve, right, to drown? Really? Joe over here, every time he sees me, he throws a rock at my head. That's right. He says some insult. He throws things. He curses at me. What a jerk. God save him. Yeah, but I want you to befriend him. (laughs) No, God. No, that's too much. This person is horrible. Yeah, and I want you to build trust with them and lead them to me. I want you to build a fire in the middle of your life that other people will start to rally around. Oh, but wait. You got to keep your distance. You're dangerous. Whatever, for whatever reason, you're dangerous. I got to protect myself. I got to protect my family. I got to protect my belongings. I remember we had somebody who let some folks stay in their house, and they stole from them. And several people a little bit of myself included was saying well maybe that wasn't the smartest thing you ever did let those people stay you didn't even know them that well they took of course they took from you and it's like okay so what I did that God led me to do is it worth risking some money or some objects, some material? Is it worth risking a, my potential reputation? What if someone sees me walking with that person? What if someone sees me standing in Cumberland Farms parking lot with a known drug dealer? And I'm talking to them and trying to build a relationship with them so that they can know and change. They can know God and allow Him to change their lives. Or is it like, Oh, whoa, what is, what is Pastor Mike doing with a drug dealer? I knew it. I knew that guy was bad news. I just knew it. Him and that little church over there singing that weird music. I knew it. Let me get that off. I'm going to message some people. I just saw Pastor Mike with a known drug dealer. That's not a coincidence, is it? I think he looked a little high, too. Eyes a little bloodshot, I'm pretty sure. And what are we willing to risk? Or are we just kind of comfortable in our coat, knowing, wow, I feel good. I know Jesus. I'm going to heaven. Got a good job. Got my family. I feel so good. God's like, all right, I want you to open the coat, take it off, build a fire. Ah! Come on, I just got where I wanted to be. I just retired. I just got the right job. I just, you know, whatever these things are in our lives, and we look back, and God's like, I love you, but I, I also love all of them. And as much as my kids drive me nuts, I don't want to see any of them die. As much, and I, I got to be honest. There's been a couple of times in my life where I was like, geez, Lord, 
wouldn't it have been a little easier if I didn't have a couple of these kids? I mean, really? I'm sorry. I have to acknowledge. But in the heat of a moment, you say things, you think things, but the truth is, is that I wouldn't give up any of my children for anything. I would never want them to be hurt or harmed. I love them, and God is so much better of a parent than I am. And he loves without condition. We have the very, currently, in the 21st century, we have the full scripture, we know Jesus, the very word, the very mind of God on earth preaching love and acceptance. And it's like inside of us, we want to read about Noah and say, yeah, all these people deserve what they get. And God's calling us to let go of the anger, let go of all of that venom and allow God to grow your heart in love. Take off your fur coat, folks. Build a fire and ask all those people to gather around to warm themselves up. Stop being afraid. Stop thinking that if they see you with some dude with a red hat on, that somehow you're going to be now, oh, they're one of those. Now let's take care of that. <laughs> let's boycott his bit. Whatever it is. It's like, are we going to really fear that? Or are we going to say, well, those people deserve it? Or whatever that runs through our minds that God's like, no, no, no. There's a flood coming, folks. All of us are going to experience this flood at some point, And it's going to overwhelm us. And for some of us, we're going to, God's going to take us home. I mean, we're all going to go home at some point. We're all going to die at some point. But their floods come. And he calls some of us to be building a ship in our lives. And he says, I want you to be gathering people up. Because whenever this tsunami comes, whatever it looks like in each one of your lives, God offers a refuge. He offers a safe harbor. And even when we pass from this life to the next, the Bible says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's pretty good. We have nothing to fear, folks. Get out there. Love people. Build relationships and trust so that they too can know the God that we serve. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that we would be willing to surrender all these things in our lives that we hold so dear that terrify us of letting go. And I pray, Lord, that we would not allow that fear, our personality traits, our possessions, our reputations, any of that stuff keep us from loving and drawing people in to the good news that you love us and you do everything for us and you've done everything for us. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to uh, sing Surrender All.
craving for vague recognition, fleshly indulgence and worldly ambition. I want so much more to make you the forgive, to serve you in secret, never to know Let's go this week uh, understanding that floods are coming in people's lives and some of them are barely staying afloat as it is. Let's offer them a refuge um, in our lives and our homes and our situations. Go in peace. Hope to see you next week.